Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another lecture in Geography 340, Climatology. Uh, I'm Dr. Zach Hilgendorf, and today we are going to be talking about surface air temperatures. Very pertinent, especially uh, given shortly prior to recording this, we had a snowstorm uh, in, in the middle of October. So surface air temperatures are probably of concern to a lot of Midwesterners right now. So we're going to first start off by talking about patterns and controls on surface air temperature. So what is air temperature? Well, simply put, it is the is a measure of the average kinetic energy of randomly moving gas particles. So what we feel is colder temperatures is really just air particles that are not as excited as warmer particles. So we can see in these uh, GIFs on the bottom here, the left GIF is an example of a colder air mass with slower moving particles, while the GIF on the right is an example of a warmer air mass with more excited, faster moving particles. Now this GIF in the middle uh, shows how a thermometer works. So as air particles collide with that thermometer, the energy is transferred to the mercury within, expanding that mercury, which we can then read as a temperature value. So here we can see less kinetic energy, more kinetic energy, air molecules move slower in cold air, mercury doesn't rise, molecules move rapidly in warm air, causing mercury to rise. So there we can kind of understand what a thermometer is and why we use it um, and how cold or warm temperatures drive that. So what is surface air temperature then? Well, that's a complicated question because you could ask yourself what is the air temperature at 1.2 to 2.0 meters above the surface or you could maybe ask yourself what is the temperature in the shade or possibly over a natural ground cover or an artificial ground cover well really temperature can vary drastically across our surface so one tool we can actually use to get at or try to get at more accurate measurements of ambient conditions is this thing here called a Stevenson screen. So it was actually first developed uh, by a Scottish civil engineer named Thomas Stevenson in the mid 1800s. Quick fun side fact, uh, if you are a literary fan, uh, Thomas Stevenson was the father of Robert Louis Stevenson, whose books Treasure Island and The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you may have heard of before. So Stevenson and the Stevenson screen is actually a small weather station that's used to measure local weather conditions. It protects the temperature sensors inside from being influenced uh, directly or by reflected sunlight. Stevenson screens are always painted white to better reflect the sun's rays. The sides, you can see them there, kind of these slatted sides here, allows air, or outside air to flow around the thermometer so we get an accurate representation of uh, air temperature or ambient air temperature. At some locations, this airflow is assisted by a psychrometer motor that pumps outside air from the instruments inside. You can see part of it sticking up above the screen. It looks a bit like a horn, for example. Uh, one will typically include a thermometer for maximum and minimum temperatures, a hygrometer for wet bulb and dry, bu or dry bulb temperatures, uh, and then outside of the Stevenson screen, there will normally be a rain gauge an anemometer for wind measurements, and a barometer uh, for pressure, and then a wind vane for direction. Now let's start talking about uh, patterns and controls on surface with a focus on diurnal and temporal differences. So surface air is largely controlled by radiant energy and the radiant energy balance on the surface. So recall our last few lectures where we talked about incoming solar radiation, also called insulation, right? We learned how to calculate the average insulation for a given place using the noon sun angle. We really only have net energy gained through insulation during the time period when the sun is visible, right? During the daylight, daytime. So on this diagram, we can see some interesting relationships. So first let's look at the axes here. We can see on the bottom, uh, the time of day from midnight to midnight. So the left side uh, is the midnight on one day and then the right side is midnight on the next day. So this is one 24 hour period, a full diurnal cycle. The vertical axis uh, shows 
first temperature uh, expressed by that green line there, and then radiant energy gained or lost in watts per meter squared, uh, denoted by the shaded blue and shaded red areas. So energy gained refers to inputs of insulation, uh, while energy lost represents energy lost through long wave radiation. So incoming, we have the, the red, the energy gained is through insulation, the energy lost is through uh, output thermal or long wave radiation from the Earth. We can see the minimum and maximum temperatures expressed by the intersection of the green line and the vertical black dashed lines. At the minimum temperature, we see that the energy lost and the energy gained lines intersect. Likewise, we see this with the maximum temperature point as well. What's interesting to note, however, is that these minima and maximum points don't line up with sunrise, solar noon, and sunset. Weird. Why? Well, as the sun starts to rise, the Earth is roughly at its minimum point of long wave emitted energy, having been emitting this energy all through the night, right? Once there's no sun in the sky, we're kind of losing energy. We're emitting that energy that we've the sun has been heated with and has been intersecting the whole day. So as the sun starts to rise, uh, kind of like right at sunrise, and the sun finally gets above the horizon, uh, and spreads the first faint rays of solar energy across the surface, there is finally some incoming radiation. However, for several minutes, the meager amount of incoming radiation is not sufficiently large enough to counter the amount of long wave energy still being emitted from the surface. As a result, the surface temperature continues to drop even in the face of the newly risen sun. As Earth continues to heat up through the day light hours, material across the surface is getting warmer. However, it isn't until a little bit past noon, or solar noon, for example, sometimes mid-afternoon even, uh, until we feel that maximum point. So we can kind of see it's almost a lag effect, right? So we hit our peak, and then we see the maximum temperature maybe a few hours afterwards. And really, that's the point when we see the maximum amount of energy emitted from the Earth uh, kind of exhibiting that maximum temperature. So while it's not the point where our energy gained is at its maximum, that's still kind of rising, but as the sun's setting and we've had energy being gained throughout the day, that maximum temperature aligns with the point of maximum emitted long wave radiation from the Earth. So we can see these relationships reflected in this real data set from the Eau Claire Regional Airport, September 29th of 2012. So here we can see sunrise with the coldest temperature immediately after the sunrise. We can see solar noon with the warmest temperature shortly thereafter. And we can see sunset when temperatures start to rapidly drop off. So here, this is what it looks like on a sunny day, right? This is the diagram that we just walked through. But what happens when it's not a sunny day out? Do we have this type of trend or does it vary? Well, it actually varies quite a bit. This is what we can see here. So in days with variable weather, perhaps cloudy days, humid days, or perhaps windy days, these relationships are stunted given greater reflection of insulation by cloud cover, greater absorption of insulation by water vapor, perhaps greater mixing of air masses by the wind. So something to think about here, especially considering windy days, for example. We may recall that differential pressure is what really drives differences in wind patterns across the surface. So air in high pressure zones moves towards low pressure zones due to the pressure gradient force. And we can see this in that top GIF there uh, by the Department of Atmospheric Sciences, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. So this exchange can lead to forced convection, which we also refer to as mechanical turbulence. Given that warm air rises in the atmosphere and cold air descends, this forced convection is driven by a mixing of air masses. So we're distributing uh, that thermal energy, right? That energy that we've been gaining, we're distributing that more across the atmosphere rather than concentrating it in one given place. So we actually have mixing, 
turbulence of our of these air masses and that's kind of what drives kind of a lower temperature for example you can see there kind of the warm air and the cold air switching places so if these systems were perfect we would expect to see symmetrical peaks and valleys right well Instead, we see a considerable amount of noise. None of these, or almost none of these, look perfect. There are dips and variations throughout the day. So this is uh, because of really variations in pressure and wind across the surface, and perhaps surface cover, that impact that distribution of energy and drive differences in surface air temps. So this graph here is represents a one-month record from the 12th of March to the 13th of April in 2020. And it shows widespread variations in diurnal temperatures. Just based on temperature alone, we can interpret that perhaps, for example, over here in the 18th to the 20th of March, maybe there was substantial cloud cover. Something was going on where we saw maybe a pulse of, you know, we see some kind of heightened temperatures in general, but there aren't rapid fluctuations. So maybe a warmer air mass was moving through, but the sun wasn't there, and we're kind of seeing a stunted relationship between these peaks and these valleys. Perhaps, maybe even we still had snow cover, right? It was mid-March, it's not hard to believe. Now, moving over here to the 1st and 3rd of April, we can see high peaks, low valleys. This is probably because this was maybe a much sunnier day similar over here maybe a cold front pushed through but it was still sunny maybe it was a high pressure system so you have higher winds perhaps a cold front moving through but it was sunny enough to still see these fluctuations in daily temperatures so there are a lot that really go into driving diurnal and temporal changes in our average temperatures but this is kind of a start to kind of understand how we start to see these changes. So now let's move on to something else. Annual patterns and controls on surface air temperature. So let's look at a couple of graphs here. So here we can see the average monthly temperatures for Columbia, Missouri and Nuquin, Argentina. They're basically at the same latitude in their respective hemispheres. Notice, however, that their averages don't line up. Why? Why is that? Well, for starters, the seasons are flipped, right? If you notice, Columbia, Missouri, we're in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, Nuquin, Argentina, we're in the Southern Hemisphere. So that's one, you know, description, one way to describe or express why these are different, why we don't see peaks in July on both, for example. What else could be driving these differences? Well, Columbia, in Missouri, in the middle of the United States, situated in the middle of a very large North American continent. So very far away from the moderating effects of a body of water, like an ocean, a river, Great Lake. Nuquin is in the middle of a much thinner landmass in Southern Argentina, and also uh, landward of a number of different mountain chains. So there's a multitude of different drivers for temperature especially just in these two cases here. So make sure to really think about what could be driving temperature for a given location. So the easiest one to start thinking about or talking about is here, it's meteorological seasons, right? As we alluded to, these seasons play a large role in driving surface air temperatures. And if we think back to our past lectures, these had a large role in driving the amount of available insulation for a given place on the planet. So here we can see five separate graphs of mean monthly temperatures for Little Rock, Arkansas, Astoria, Oregon, St. Cloud, Minnesota, Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada, and Verkoyanks in Russia. So let's think about the drivers here. So feel free to pause the video and pull up a map to follow along. So I'll go ahead and do that if you want to do so now. So Little Rock, St. Cloud, and Verkoyanks are all far away from a moderating body of water. That's definitely something important to think about. We notice that Little Rock is in the southernmost of these three, while St. Cloud is located a little bit closer to uh, our latitude, and Verko Yanks is just inside of the Arctic Circle. So we can see the impact that latitude and associated insulation values have on these continental cities. 
about Astoria located along the Pacific coast and uh, in Oregon and near our latitude and Halifax also located along our latitude, but on the Atlantic coast. So these two have relatively smaller temperature ranges. So we can probably thank the maritime effect and the impact of water as a moderator on temperature, but all in all, they still exhibit decent seasonal relationships between temperature and really energy, right? So as we move through the seasons, go from January to July to back to December and January, we see this hump in the middle of the year during our uh, meteorological summer period, right? Makes sense, right? So the further you get, for example, Verkoyanks, you see a much more drastic variation in those seasonal average temperatures. So these five mean monthly temperature graphs from Manaus, Brazil, Lambarene, Gabon, Nairobi, Kenya, Iquique, Chile, pardon me, and Vitoria, uh, Brazil, are in the equatorial and sub-equatorial zones and are impacted a lot less by seasonal variations. There are still seasonal variations and we can see them, much less so in Manaus uh, and a little bit in Gabon. Those are located almost on the equator, as is Nairobi. There are other drivers there, but we can kind of see how these change once you get into the equatorial and sub-equatorial regions versus much further away from these equatorial zones, how the impact of seasons plays a much stronger role in driving temperature differences from month to month. Now let's get back to thinking about our old friend Vladimir Kepin and how Kepin climates can be used to describe air temperature. You're all masters at this now, right? You've done it before, but we're gonna actually dive into and review a little bit. It's just gonna be a few quick slides on Kepin. So let's think back, review our Kepin climate classification here. So we have our main groups, right? A, B, C, D, and E. We're not gonna worry about B for these purposes here because we're talking about temperature and B is driven uh, primarily by precipitation, right? So for A, all mean monthly temperatures are uh, greater than or equal to 18 degrees Celsius. For E on the other side, these are our polar climates, all mean monthly temperatures are less than 10 degrees Celsius. For C, all mean monthly temperatures are greater than or equal to negative three degrees Celsius. And then D, at least one mean monthly temperature is less than three degrees Celsius. Negative three degrees Celsius, pardon me. Our temperature subgroups, we're not gonna worry about the precipitation groups in this example because we're, we care about temperature today. We have A, B, C, D, right? A, our warmest mean monthly temperature is greater than or equal to 22 degrees Celsius. D, our coldest mean monthly temperature is less than uh, negative 38 degrees Celsius. B, at least four mean monthly temperatures are greater than or equal to 10 degrees Celsius. And then C, one to three mean monthly temperatures are greater than or equal to 10 degrees Celsius. So for these five cities, take a second to pause the video and work out the main group. So A, C, D, or E, capital A, C, D, or E and the temperature subgroup, so lowercase a, b, c, or d. I'll have them listed in the description below. So we really, we don't care again about the precipitation uh, subgroup. We just care about the main group and the temperature subgroup. So go ahead and work those out and look below to see how you did. All right, how about for these five? We can ignore EKK or EKK, pardon me, uh, because despite being a port city, it falls into the B climate main group. So ignore that one for these purposes. And also make sure to recall that A climates do not have a temperature subgroup. They only have precipitation subgroups, right? Monsoonal, tropical, etc. Savannah, those, those are these different kind of precipitation driven subgroups. So if it's an A climate, you just have A. All right, so moving on to a little bit 
larger scale in general, local patterns and controls. So to, uh, topography is, is a major one, right? So here in these high alpine areas, you can have cold air drainage. So think of cold air descending, warm air rising. You can basically get kind of these bottlenecks. And you can see it here uh, by the clouds there, that kind of cloudy uh, layer within the mountain. Those areas are kind of a sink. They actually act as kind of like a bowl for, for these temperatures. So temperature can be driven by topography. You can see it here as well. So in these misty mornings in these low valley areas, you can see colder temperatures. We see this fog here. It's kind of an indicator of thermal differences. So condensation within these low areas relative to the hot air around it. We can see it here. Topography has another impact based off of its slope aspect. So depending on whether you're on a north or a south facing slope, depending on which her, uh, hemisphere you're in, that can play a really important role in your temperature gradient from one place to the other. So here we can see, uh, this is uh, Fremont Peak. And we can see on the right side here, that's shaded, like the shaded from the sun. On the other side, the left side, we see no vegetation. That might be getting the brunt of the sun, for example. So maybe vegetation isn't able to grow there. Same thing here. We see that exact same relationship. So that gets at an important aspect of thermal differences and temperature differences on the planet. Vegetation, vegetation cover, right? So trees kind of act like clouds. They give us shade. And with shade, we have colder temperatures, right? We're not heating that area as much as an area without trees, right? It makes sense because, you know, if you walk, where do you go for shade if you're walking through the woods? Are you walking in this flat savanna on a really hot day? Or are you walking under those trees to stay nice and cool? So they block insulation. That's what shade is. So they also have a slow loss of long wave electromagnetic radiation to space. Trees also transpire a lot. So they pump out a lot of moisture into the atmosphere. Whereas if you were in an area like this, maybe a semi-arid to arid environment, you're not gonna have that same effect. Now there is a very small impact, but because we don't have large biomass here, we don't have a you know really tall lush trees, we're not gonna have the same impact and change in our temperature gradients as we would in kind of a you know forested area or uh, somewhere with significantly like a you know sequoia redwood forest versus a uh, succulent cacti plain here right so it makes sense I, I think if, if you think of what trees are and how they much space they take up they can have a really major impact on temperature. So can we, <laughs> uh, that's where, this is where we're going to go. This is the last subject for this video. Anthropogenic global warming, humans play a massive role in changing surface temperatures. So here we can see, uh, we saw this in a previous lecture, annual global temperature anomalies. We see our 20th century average uh, up through, up, up to 1940. Um, and we see kind of the major kick off around 1940 and towards the present uh, in temperature anomalies. So increases in temperature relative to our 20th century averages. So that comes from a lot of different areas, from industry, from transportation, from how we build our cities and, and what goes into kind of our urban core. Uh, one great place to go, and I'll provide this link in the description below is the climate time machine. This is put on by NASA. So here we can see, uh, this is the climate time machine. It's got kind of visualizations to show how sea ice, sea level, carbon dioxide and global temperature are changing over time. And I, I really invite you to look through each of these. It's a quick website. It just has some really great graphics and animations to show how these different aspects are changing over time. 
So humans are playing a major role, and we've kind of alluded to this uh, in a number of videos to this point. We'll learn a lot more about it in the coming weeks as we talk about some of these drivers and how we're changing uh, our, our climate and our atmosphere. So urbanization is, is one of the big ones, right? So if you've probably heard of the urban heat island effect. Basically what this says is that depending on where you are, if you're in the downtown area or a commercial area or an urban residential area, you're gonna see these kind of peaks and fluctuations in temperature. Now that deals with what our, what how we create our environment, right? So if we have black asphalt or pavement, we have black buildings, we think of what's really good at absorbing energy, it's these dark colored surfaces. Now, as you get further out, you have more grass, less uh, asphalt or concrete, things like that, you start to see kind of a drop in that. Once you get out to rural areas or where there's parks or farmland, for example, you start to see more typical temperatures for what that day should expect. And it's really interesting because we're trying to come up with ways to combat this and, and alter how heated our cities are. And actually in my, uh, my alma mater at, at Arizona State University, uh, they had the, basically are one of the world leaders in, in understanding, quantifying, and considering how to build desert cities and how to function as a city in these incredibly heated areas. The Phoenix metropolitan area is one of the big ones. Um, they're experimenting with all sorts of interesting things like painting pavement white uh, to increase the albedo. If we were, we talked about albedo recently to kind of in increase how reflective that surface is to decrease overall temperatures because you're bouncing back more insulation into space to increase green space. That's a really big detractor of temperatures because we just talked about the moderating effect that vegetation can have on heat. It's really interesting to think about. Now it's not, you know, it's not restricted to these massive desert or semi-arid cities. We think of Los Angeles, California, Seoul, um, Phoenix, Dallas, Fort Worth, these massive metropolitan areas. Happens in our own backyard too. So here we can see the Twin Cities metro area. This is the urban heat island uh, on the top of this figure from uh, Smoliak et al. 2015 in the Journal of Applied Meteorology and Climatology. We can see the summertime, so June, July, August, and September, nighttime means and daytime mean temperatures relative to what the average should be, or at least the average is in the surrounding areas. And we see the winter time or December, January, February, March means uh, on the bottom there. So I invite you to go look at pages 66 and 67 in your textbooks. Uh, for a small vignette on the urban heat island. Really good one, uh, definitely recommend it. So it's definitely something interesting to think about is how do we change how we function in urban environments because of temperature. And let's go back to our friend, oh, Vladi Keppen there. It's important to remember that the Keppen climate classifications are dynamic and change as the average temperatures change. As Earth is warming, we can see how climates are projected to change as temperature changes, where climate classifications are expected to change. This gift shows projected shifts in climate or Keppen climate from 1981 through 2100. With anthropogenic warming, we will witness shifting climates across the globe. We're already seeing these trends in global aridification and desertification, where arid climates are encroaching on areas that were previously semi-arid. And we're going to start seeing these shifts in biomes across the world. So watch this go through a few times. Rewind it if you need to and listen to me talk or mute me. But watch it. And it, it's a really fascinating GIF uh, from Rubel and Kodak 2010. Uh, there's a lot of change that's going to happen. And we're seeing it globally. So watch that through. Next up. We're gonna talk about global drivers in surface air temperatures. We're gonna to allude to a few that we're gonna really dive into in the next couple of weeks here. So I hope you enjoy the video um, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.